Shalom, and welcome to Christians with Torah, the Beit Tehillah Community Podcast. We believe the Torah is relevant for our lives today, God's teachings and instructions. You may very well be part of the first generation to be born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, and have the Torah, a Christian with Torah. Join us as we honor the living God through the study of His Word, topical conversations, and interviews with special guests. Please welcome our hosts, Pastor Nick Plummer and Ryan Cabrera. Shalom, everybody, and welcome to Christians with Torah, the Bait Tehillah Community Podcast. I'm your co-host, Ryan Cabrera, and here I am yet again in Studio B with Pastor Nick Plummer. Hey, Pastor Nick. It's uh, good to be here. Yeah. Be, it's good to be here. It's good to be in Studio be, B. Yeah. This is a good studio. It is. It is. Uh, B, terrific. We've got three studios, A, B, and C. That's right. We're blessed. You know? We are. We haven't been in Studio A in a long time, though. That's good. That, yeah. That'll be a, a, a crisis. Yeah. <laughs> it's been, uh, we are in the FEMA. last days. You never a know. FEMA act or something. All right. So thank you guys for coming. Uh, this is Christians with Torah. It's exactly what it sounds like. We're Christians right? Which means we believe in the basic Christian doctrine. We believe that Jesus is the Messiah. We call him Yeshua. We use Yeshua and Jesus interchangeably. Uh, We believe uh, that he died for our sins, to make an atonement for our sins, to wash our sins away, praise God, that he is the Son of God, and that God raised him from the dead, and that he is Lord, right? So that's the basic Christian doctrines, and we also believe that the whole Bible, from Genesis to Maps, is relevant for believers today, and we put an emphasis on the Torah, the first five books. Why? Well, first off, because nobody else does. So it's our little thing, you know what I mean? It's the thing that we do. But also because you can take the principles that God laid out in the Torah, his teachings and instructions, and apply them to every area of your life. Right? Oh, that'll set you apart. So many people are looking for direction in their life. They're looking for what do I do in this situation or that situation. And if they would just go to the Bible and look at what it says and just do that, they would already have the answer. Praise God. So... uh, for four years, we did the Torah portion, so we broke down the four uh, first five books of the Bible, um, and then last year we did the Gospel of Matthew, and we took a year and a half, actually, to do the Gospel of Matthew, and now we are in the book of Acts. And so we started the book of Acts uh, a couple of weeks back. We're in uh, episode four, so what is that? So three weeks ago we started uh, the book of Acts, and today we are studying Acts chapter three, and we're going to go through the whole chapter, verses one through twenty-six. All right, that's cool. All right, that's cool. I was just uh, looking over some of these time periods here. That's right. So we're going to start with Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Are you going to read or am I going to read? I don't know. We'll have to look at something here. I was just looking up something. I can Uh, read. You can read? I can read. I will read. That almost sounded like Akari. Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Now Peter and John went up together, because this is the healing of the lame man. They went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about, go into the temple, ask an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. So here's the lame man at the beautiful gate. Right. Peter and John. All right, so so uh, Peter and John are there. The Jews, in general, observe prayer three times a day. Now, that's still going on today. I think the times have changed a little bit. I think at the yeah. time of Yeshua, um, the, they're referencing the ninth hour. Is the ninth hour three o'clock? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Right? That, okay. I, I get. Oh, that's cool. I was thinking of noon. Right. Because so, like, the first hour would be the six a.m. hour, right? So then you come to the ninth hour, and that would be three p.m. Because you have six plus. And that's three. when Yeshua passed, passed away. away. Correct. So, um, so, so then that's good. Okay. So the morning uh, prayer would be the third hour, or about nine a.m. And then the afternoon, or the it would be the ninth hour, would be three p.m. And the evening one would be sunset. Yeah, I heard like nine, twelve, and three. But then again, I also so that's saw, that's present day I, nine, I twelve, thought, and three. I, I thought sunset. You know, so, so you have like the shakarit morning, afternoon, sunset. Yes, yeah, so you have the shakarit, which would be like the morning prayers. Right. Um, so like the prayers today, the three times a day are named after the three 
uh, offerings, right? The three sacrifices that would happen on a daily basis. So the beautiful gate uh, was an entrance to the temple, not an entrance to the city. It was one of the favored entrances, and many people passed through it on their way to worship. Now, giving money to people who were poor was considered praiseworthy in the Jewish religion. And so men, uh, so the man begging wisely placed himself where he would be seen by the most people who were on their way to worship at the temple. Now, that's, this is going on today, good. right? So people that are going to the Western Wall and to the Temple Mount today, it's one of the strangest things that you'll see. You'll see all these people like begging um, near the Kotel, the, uh, the Western Wall complex. I think that's true. It's and been then a while for me. As you go to the Temple Mount... It, it's years. not on like the mall there, right? It's always like at the roads, the paths going towards it. So like as you're going up and down yeah. the stairs on the one end or oh, that's from the other side, you'll see people and um, you'll see like uh, ultra Orthodox folks. They'll be selling like red yarn and stuff. Um, I've even had it that's while Kabbalah, I was. Yeah. Mm-hmm, I was even at the hotel one time and some guy came up and was like insistent on blessing me. You know, and as a Christian, you're like, oh, this spirit, this guy just feels like he wants to bless me. You know, so he comes and then he gives you the blessing in Hebrew, you know, and then he puts his hand out. Right. And so you're like, you know, you want to like, so you experience give that? Him a high, oh, I experienced that. So what would you do? I gave him what shekels I had in my pocket. I had some coins and he looked at me like, that's it. And I'm like, man, get out of here. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Like, I. <laughs> anyways, it was an interesting little, little moment there at the Koto because wow. he was insistent. See, like, I'm like, going to bless you. So and the I'm lame like, at the beautiful gate is like relevant oh man oh yeah that's sure. a good point though. i never really thought about that you're right they are there are beggars in jerusalem oh yeah well and it, i think that is kind of one of the shocking things is you know when you see orthodox jewish people that are <clears> there <throat> begging and it's usually like some old guys and stuff you know sitting down or whatever and they'll be begging but that's all beside the point so let's keep rolling so uh verse three who seeing peter and john about to go into the temple asked for alms Right? And Peter, fasting his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to perceive something of them. So the word alms here is the Greek word elimosine. And I have no I probably butchered that. I think it's pretty good, pretty close. I you know what's funny? I um I've I've pretty much convinced myself that the guy on Blue Letter Bible with the voice, he's like got a like country voice, that like I don't know. I don't know if these are the right pronunciations. <laughs> you know I, mean? I, don't, I, just, I just don't know. But it's all Greek to me, you know? So Maybe there is different ways of pronouncing something. You see what I did there? Epigalia. Epangalia. E- Epangalia. Yeah, so, yeah, right. there's a difference. It is. Uh, and, of course, that word is divine assurance of good. It's the word means promise. Translated as promise. That's right, promise. Right? But we're not doing that. We're doing Epangalia. alms. Alms right now, which Epigalia. is elimusine. And it means compassionateness, i.e., as exercised toward the poor, beneficence, or concretely a benefaction, alms deeds. So this is this is good. So so Peter and John going into the temple, they encounter this man who has been um, lame since birth. Right? He hasn't been able to walk. And so just keep in mind that because he's at the entrance of the beautiful gate of the temple, which is one of the most popular gates to go through, hence it's called the beautiful gate. Many, many people have seen this man, know this man, because they've seen him for, what is it, 40 years as they go in and out of the temple. And so we're going to do the alms. Strong's G, 1654, <laughs> Ele Masune. Ele Masune. It's got to be right. I mean, if he says it, it's got to be right. That's the, the way you pronounce Ele Masune. The, Greek alms. word for alms. For alms. Elemosune. Elemosune. That's cool. I like that. I just wish I could do his accent. Elemosune. You know, I just, I can't really bring myself my, to do uh, it. My Waze app, I use uh, the, uh, the, the, the Englishman. Oh, cheerio. It's a good old chap. Boulevard. Boulevard. Lithia Pinkrest. <laughs> Boulevard. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Can you, I'll read chapter 3, verses 6 through 10. So Peter and John come into contact with a lame man yes. at the beautiful gate. Okay. Yes. All right. Let's go ahead. So then Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. 
And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. Wow. The man asked for money, but Peter gave him something much better, the use of his legs. We often ask God to solve small problems, but he wants to give us a whole new life and help for all our problems. Wow, that's interesting, you know. You know, you're, he's begging for money, but he gets to have the ability to walk. Well, I, I would argue His that... His feet and ankle bones receive strength. Wow. They were, he was feeble, yeah. Let's say that this man had millions of dollars, right? Um, would he give up all of that money to have the ability to walk? I would. So it makes you think, though. I would. So, I, I, so maybe in this guy's case, I would agree. Because, I mean, at this point, his quality of life is such that he sits at the beautiful right. gate and begs. But then I think about guys like, uh, what is it, Nick Vutrek? You know who I'm talking about? The guy with no arms and no legs? Yeah. Motivational speaker? Yeah. Part of the reason that he is who he is today and that he's such an inspiration to so many people is because he doesn't have arms and legs. Right. So then, like, in his position, would he trade what he has for arms and legs to be able to walk now? I, I wonder what the answer to that question is. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure it would cross his mind. It's it, like, would you rather, <laughs> you know, those scenarios. You know, um, looking at this, um, which is really interesting, uh, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Of course, this is the first distinctive use of the name in healing power after the ascension and glorification of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. So what I like to throw out is that I like to pray in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach of Nazareth. Yeah. Or in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Because you're actually um, giving him more of an identity. Yeah. Not just any Jesus. Well, I don't know Nazareth. anybody whose last name is Christ other than Jesus. That's true. Jesus Christ of Nazareth. <laughs> oh, except for um, Joseph Christ, his father. I know that uh, Pastor Henry Wright was, yeah, Pastor Henry Wright was uh, actually... Uh, talking about you're supposed to laugh at my jokes i i know (laughs) i know but yeah i mean the thing is though uh he was saying that uh they they had better results using in the name of jesus christ of nazareth than just in the name of jesus interesting it was like more authority more power i don't know i can't explain it but i mean it's interesting i will say this pray in his name if nothing more than just having the faith to read the scripture and do as it says that's true right you're copying him yeah that's a good point that's a good point you know, um, and I love this, you know, in verse 9 of, of chapter 3. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement <coughs> at that which had happened unto him. You know, I mean, think about it. It's like if you see someone in a wheelchair, then all of a sudden they're walking around the church. What? What? Yeah. So, so it's interesting. Especially, that like, imagine, like, say somebody's at the church and, like, they're in a wheelchair and, like, you've personally helped them in and out of their car. Yeah. You've done these, like, you know, this person can't yeah. walk. It's they not like they, they just, just walking, rolled in. They and, just, yeah. I mean, look at this. In his excitement, the lame man, yep. the formerly crippled man began to jump, walk around, and praise God. Come on. I mean, he was that healed, that much healed. Then others were awed by God's power. Don't forget to thank people who help you. And remember to praise God for his care and protection. Come on. Don't forget to thank people who help you. And remember to praise God for his care and protection. That's, that's good. You know, that's another thing that we, 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 we pray to God and we thank him. We thank him for, uh, for provision. We thank him for healing. We don't, we, we don't need to be asking for these things. We thank him. You know? Yeah. Because what father would not want to give healing or provision to their children, you know? So we have this incredible uh, miracle that took place at the beautiful gate with Peter and John. It's interesting. Why wasn't it Peter and Andrew, his brother, divvied them up, you know? But Peter and John, you know, they were they were in the inner circle. Right, Peter, James, and John. Yeah, Peter, James, and John. So, so let me go ahead and read because we're going to have uh, Peter addresses the people. And I'm going to read verses 11 to 15. Peter addresses the people. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, 
All the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's greatly wondering. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, You men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? The God of Abraham, and of Isaac, and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses." Wow, yeah. Wow. So Solomon's porch uh, was a part of the temple complex built by King Herod the Great in an attempt to strengthen his relationship with the Jews. Uh, Now, this porch was an entrance supported by columns. Jesus taught and performed miracles in the temple many times. When the apostles went to the temple, they were undoubtedly in close proximity to the same religious leaders who conspired to put Jesus to death. Wow. Pretty interesting. Now, uh, one of the things that I notice here is, then, is the lame man which was healed held Peter and John. All the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. So first and foremost, Peter now has all of these people's attention, right? There is a spectacle that is happening. So this is reminiscent of Acts chapter 2, where the same thing happened, where the Holy Spirit fell, and these uh, disciples are talking, and the people are hearing them in their own language, and now everybody's marveling, like, whoa, what is this? So so the first thing is, uh, it's almost like, you ever heard the term peacocking? Peacocking is when somebody would, like, uh, wear something, like, really flashy, and then, like, people will talk to them, you know? And it just gets them, it's a conversation starter, because it's just out of the ordinary. This is almost like that, right? So so people are attracted to the spectacle, you know? Somebody falls down. Oh, everybody surrounds and comes and checks it out, right? Or somebody's doing a trick or whatever. People circle around. You know, you've been to, like, the beach where they have, like, like uh, performers, street performers and stuff. Everybody, like, circles around. So same idea here. This lame man who's been lame his whole life, all these people know who he is, is now walking and jumping and praising God. And people are like, wait, that's that guy. Come on, man. You see this? That guy's walking. Can you believe it? And so they're wondering what's going on. So what does Peter do? He does what he did the last time. He says, uh, he says, ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us as though it was by our own power or holiness that we made this man walk? So, so they're going to give Jesus glory. They're giving the glory like to that. the Lord. That's right. That's cool. And they're calling the people out like, why is this a surprise to you? Like, we've told you already these things were coming. Why are you surprised now that it's here? Right? That's kind of the, the point. It's powerful right there in Jerusalem. So um, we do have a quick discussion question here. How, discuss how God— Did you do Solomon's Porch? I did. You read that? I did. Man, I don't remember hearing that. Yeah. yeah. That you was were, part, of the, part of the Temple Mount. Probably in the well. Solomon's it's, it's a Porch. a deep subject. You know? I think I was. So discuss how God healed you of a physical ailment or infirmity. Well, I have an interesting testimony. I was in a car accident where someone rear-ended me at a high speed. Mm. Thank God I didn't go through the windshield or any of that, but it was it was pretty disturbing. Uh, and, and, of course, as a result, I uh, had three bulging discs. Ugh. They're all out of line, bulging. But after becoming born again in March of 92, God healed me soon after. So I didn't really think about it. So I hadn't been able to go running or do weightlifting. So when I came to know the Lord... And I was following up on my chiropractor and everything. And he did an MRI. They did an MRI, another x-ray and all this stuff. And they said, he's like, well, it looks like you got a bona fide miracle. Nice. So, you know, I was like um, just sharing that with him. Like, wow, I didn't even ask for it. I didn't even know he was going to do it. And he did it. I didn't really think about my bolding disc. Yeah. I was so saved and born again. <laughs> that Yeah. And so I have a medical file and everything. But I had to take a... Uh, uh, out of the Marine Corps Reserves, you know, I had to uh, get out of the Marines because of that, because of a health issue. Huh. It's called a, uh, what's it called? Medical discharge? Medical discharge, yeah. yeah. But then I couldn't go back and say, no, I'm healed. Oh, man. <laughs> I know. Like, I don't know about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
but yeah, so I can run. I can go weight weightlifting and yeah. So yeah, that's kind of that's, that die. You cool. can go to the gym. So I was and close to weights. Do I? Yeah, do I? Walk in the valley of the shadow of death or a near death experience. Yeah, I'll fear no evil. Praise God. You know, right there, you know, you can see it. Near death experiences, you know, could have been bad. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, so that's my my testimony. Yeah, you know, I uh, praise God. I mean, I've I've had some stuff happen to me over time, but the Lord has just my testimony. Be the Lord has protected me. He's He's done me good. Um, I have definitely been in places where I prayed for people and they received healing, which is always encouraging to our faith. You know, when you get to see um, people be healed through the laying on of hands and prayer. That'll, that'll touch your faith like nothing. You know, I don't really know what else, you know, that's why community is so important. It's the physical laying on of hands. Amen. Amen. So, all right. So, uh, <coughs> verses 13 through 15 here is kind of the, the substance of Peter's discourse here, right? Where his he's monologue. Yeah. He's going to give it to him. He's giving it to him. He's, he's dressing him up and down. So he says, The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus. So we stop there. He glorified his son Jesus, right? So who? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Just so there's no confusion here, because I know some people will confuse things in the. I've even heard people try to twist things and say that, like, the. Anyways, people say all kinds of crazies. I'm not even going to get into it. But it's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's. The son, or that's that's uh, the father of the son. Right. Okay, there's no confusion here. But who who is he? He says, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he determined to let him go. Yeah. So calling him out. Hey, Pilate wasn't going to hurt this guy. Right. But because you guys had a mob and insisted he was crucified. Right. So you can't just put this off on the Romans saying, <laughs> oh, it was the Romans that did it. Pilate was going to let him go. Right. He says, but ye denied the Holy One, talking about Yeshua, and the just, also talking about Yeshua, and desired a murderer to be granted to you. And this obviously refers to Barabbas. And killed the prince of life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. Now, Pilate had uh, decided to release Jesus, but the people had clamored to have Barabbas, a murderer, released instead. And when Peter said, ye killed the prince of life, he meant it literally. You killed the prince of life, right? And so the religious leaders thought they had put an end to Jesus when they crucified him. But their confidence was shaken when Peter told them that Jesus was alive again and that this time they could not harm him. Peter's message emphasized three things. Number one, the people and their religious leaders had killed Jesus. He's called him out. Number two, that God brought him back to life. Yeah. And number three, that the apostles had been witnesses to this fact so this is the three points that come out in his little uh diatribe here yeah because the religious leaders had killed him that's right they know they did right and that but that's why we're going to in the next set of verses he's gonna, a witness, yeah. he's going to give him an invitation which is is good because here's the thing no one else in history has been given this opportunity like these people have no one else in history was actually there condemning Yeshua to death, right? Like Peter, is like, like these this Jewish religious leaders that were there at the Temple Mount condemning Jesus to death. So because they're condemning Jesus to death, they're being given an opportunity. Even them are being given an opportunity to receive the forgiveness and power of Jesus in that moment. That's right? true. But at first they have to come to the depravity of our, their sin. So it's the same process for us today. We have to first understand that it's my sin, Ryan's sin, right, that put Yeshua on the cross. Now, I wasn't there, like, ranting and raving, chanting to put him on the cross, right, but it's still my sin that put him there. Right. And then now I have the option to receive that through repentance. That's good. um, I'm going to read verses 16 through 21. Cool. The restitution of all things. And we're going to talk about the restitution of all things. It says here, And his name through faith in his name hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I wot that you that that ignorance ye that I, I wot that through ignorance I wot <laughs> I know that through ignorance you did it. 
as did also your rulers. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of the restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. Man. Yeah, the restitution of all things. You know, it's interesting that in his name through faith in his name hath made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Now, that's twofold. So the guy didn't fight him. Peter stuck his hand out. Peter had faith. This guy had faith to grab Peter's hand. And the word faith is the Greek word pistis. And it means persuasion, credence, moral conviction of religious truth or the truthfulness of God or a religious teacher, especially reliance upon Christ for salvation, assurance, belief, believe, and fidelity. I like this persuasion. It's very interesting. We're being persuaded. Do you really believe that you're grafted in, Nick? Mm. You're not Jewish. Do you really believe... Do you have faith to believe that you're a Friam? You're a wild branch grafted in? Do you really believe that? Do you have faith? Are you persuaded? Mm. So when I met, when I met Bot Yin Angus Wooten, they persuaded me. Hey, these things you're feeling inside and you want to pursue, let me confirm, let me show you what the word says. And I'm like, I was persuaded. Meet the dryers. They're going to celebrate Passover in March of, or the spring of 92. I get saved, but in 95 is when I, you know, started putting it all together. So within three years, I was in Hebrews in my walk from being a backslidden, fallen, you know, backslidden Catholic to a, to a born again Baptocostal. Hmm. Then I got my Hebrews and became a Hebrewcostal within three years. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah. And three is, is divine. It's of the Lord. So getting saved in the spring, Hebrew roots in the spring. I love spring. Spring forward, fall back. I was born in the spring. See, look at that. So anyway, um, faith is important. You know, what do you believe? And a lot of things are being said in the world today, and do we believe it? Are we going to fall for it? Are we going to be snookered? You know, what are we going to do? But I love that. The word faith means persuasion. I love the moral conviction part, too. So, like, if I'm hearing a teaching or read a book, I have a moral conviction right. of religious truth or the truthfulness of God or a religious teacher. So, I just got done reading this book called The Good Fight, and it's about love from 1 Corinthians 13. And so, the premise of this book is, like, I'm persuaded now. I'm like, I want to love. You know, it's such a cliche. Oh, I want to love. Well, we need the roots in order to do that, to have fruit. Like, man, Nick, I feel like... Nick loves me or Nick showed love. So like saying it is one thing because it's not really about a feeling or saying it. It's about doing it. Love is a verb. It's an action. So I want to just say that these the seven roots of, of love, and I'm persuaded even now to share this because of the times we're living in with people being the way they are, broken relationships and everything else, we really do need to love one another. But uh, in order to have love, the, the roots are, of course, uh, patience, kindness, and then it's, of course, truthfulness. And after truthfulness, you have uh, protect. And then you have uh, trust, hope, and, and then uh, perseverance. So those seven things make up First Corinthians 13 for love. So I was persuaded uh, in this to, to look at that. So we'll move on. But Jesus, not the apostles, received the glory for the healing of the man. I love that. In those days, a man's name represented his character. It stood for his authority and power. By using Jesus' name, Peter showed who gave him the authority and power to heal. The apostles did not emphasize what they could do, 
but what God could do through them. Mm. I love that. You know, like yeah. even with our identity, we have the faith to believe that we are who we are because Yeshua is the root and he's brought us near in Ephesians 2. It talks about we're part of the commonwealth of Israel and Romans we're grafted in. So this is what's really cool. Uh, he goes on to say in, in Acts three seventeen and 18, and now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance you did it, as did also your rulers. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. You know, the, the, the life of Messiah is like a mosaic, especially when it comes to describing him and his suffering. So you got to go into Zechariah, you got to go into Isaiah and start pulling these scriptures, the Messianic Psalms, uh, Isaiah 53, and you start pulling these, you go, yeah, the, 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 the Christ has to suffer. You know, and that's what they're saying here. But uh, through ignorance probably means that they did not fully understand that Jesus was the true Messiah and also the true son of God. But such ignorance in scripture, while it may diminish punishment, does not fully absolve people of responsibility for their actions. That's, of course, uh, Acts 3.17. Uh, the time I was 15 to 25 were my wasted years, you know, and I look back on it now and it's like, man, I always wish I hadn't have done those things or whatever, but this is where it got me today. Um, some of these prophecies are in Psalm 22, Isaiah 50, verse 6, and Isaiah 53, which is very powerful. Peter was explaining the kind of Messiah God had sent to earth. The Jews had expected a great ruler, not a suffering servant. So it's very interesting. So God made us. We messed up. He gives us a way out. You know, God can't go against his character. So God's character, his attributes is holy, blameless, without spot or blemish. He is holy. He, he does no sin. He's perfect. But what did he do? He created us in his image. And that's powerful. For God so loved the world that gave his only because. So God created us in his image. And now as we look at this, we can really put it all together that, wow, he really did all these things for me because he, ha he had to suffer, die, and be buried. Um, going into, of course, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. I like this word repent. It is the Greek word metanoeo, metanoeo. Or metanoeo, yeah. And it means to think differently. I like that, you know. Repentance isn't about beating yourself up and everything. It's about changing your mind. Well, let's look at these guys. Yeah. They wow. believed that Jesus was a false prophet, that he was a problem, that he was a false messiah, and that he was leading the people astray. Right. But now they've seen that he was died, buried, and resurrected from the dead. Yeah. That there's many witnesses to that right. fact of his resurrection. And that now the power of the Holy Spirit as given through him right. to the apostles uh, is now healing people in their midst. That's good. So for them, it would literally be a change of mind. From what? From changing, from thinking that Jesus is a false prophet to thinking he's the one true son of right. God, the Messiah who came to save Israel. That's true. Sense. Think about it. So repent is, means to think differently or afterwards, uh, i.e. reconsider. It's, it's to morally uh, and to feel compunction. That's a fancy word there. To reconsider. That's interesting, you know. Compunction. It's like, you know, let's say that we want to think differently about the Jewish people. You know, a lot of the, the church and the evangelicals and Christians are like, well, look, he came to his own. His own didn't receive him. Look at that. Or what about... Well, let his blood be on us and our children. You know? Ooh, and so we just throw that out at the not Jews. To say. But now it's kind of like, yeah, that was said and done, but, but we should think more highly of the Jews than that. We should think more highly of them that God's made promises to them. So now we have to think differently. Let's say we criticize Judaism and then we repent. Yeah. We think differently. Because if you're going to, you know, if you're going to belittle Judaism or criticize it, then what about the Mormons or Jehovah Witnesses or... You know, so I, we got to be careful because we have to respect people's free will. Um, and it's powerful, you know. I mean, how are you ever going to win anybody or get to know anybody unless you meet them where they're at? You know, because not everybody's the same. I mean, if you think about it, it's just like, you know, the, the socialism goes against God because there's three classes of people. There's the, the rich, the middle class, and the poor. And you can even see that in the offerings. Yeah. Some can give a bull, some a little lamb, and some, you know, not even a bird, maybe some flour. 
You're so poor, you have to give flour. Sure. Very interesting. Um, now, Peter promised three results of repentance. I like this. Number one, the forgiveness of sins. Boy, that's good. So if you repent, you have forgiveness. Mm -hmm. So that's a promise. Yeah. I love that. Number two, times of refreshing. This is a mark of the Messianic age. As people are refreshed in their spirits when the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within them. This refreshing comes also to the world in general as it is affected by believers who are changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So your persona, your character, your integrity, your your, how your, your personality, you know, you come into contact with someone who's an unbeliever, not saved. It can really, really bring a refreshing. Number three, and he shall send Jesus Christ is a clear reference to the second coming since the two or since the next verse looks forward to that time. Yep. Since the next verse, which is, of course, uh, uh, verse 21 of, of three. Whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Now, um, the word restitution is the Greek word apokatastasis, apokatastasis, and it means a reconstitution or restoration. So, so that's very, very important. Um, and I have here um, a discussion for this restitution of all things. Notice all things. Discuss some of the things that God is restoring back to his children. I got just a little sentence here. Uh, identity, which is Israel, made up of Jews and non-Jews. He's restoring that. Uh, not just the Jews. People are coming out of the nations. They're grafted in. Uh, the state of Israel and the holy city of Jerusalem is being restored. It's the capital. It's real. It's, it's the deal, you know. Um, and his word, along with all the promises and prophecies, are being restored. Because yep. like the book of Daniel was sealed until the time of the end. Right. Now it's unsealed mm. for us to gather. Wow. So, yeah, so that's, that's the discussion points. And then, of course... <laughs> Uh, I'll let you chime in here. But uh, the times of restitution of all things refers to the second coming of Jesus, the last judgment, and the removal of sins from the world. I like that. So God is restoring a lot before Yeshua returns. Yeah. But the rest restitution of all things would be his actual return. Yeah. That's a restoration. I, I'll be back. I mean, you know, it's like, whoa, you know. I love that, you know, we have the ability today to read our scriptures and to look out at the land of Israel and see the the vines and the branches shooting forth go. and the restoration of the, the land itself. The desert's blooming, yeah. And that to me, I mean, of all the things, like after 2,000 years, like, can you wrap your head around that, you know, that this is happening? And this isn't really shared a lot among the, the evangelicals of the church, I don't think. Yeah, I mean, a, oh, look, there's Israel, there's the Jews back in the land, but you got to look at the, all the other prophecies. I, right, I, for sure. Like I, the vineyards, like in Jeremiah 31. Right. Look at the vineyards being. Well, just like up. saying that, you know, you love Israel and then actually loving Israel, I think are two different things. Remember, yeah, love is a, an action. Right. Well, that and, and people, I, oh, I, really? well, how do you I love think, Israel? still have me? such a, like, like, replacement theology is so ingrained in the theology of the church that it's difficult for them to even recognize where that that is in their doctrine right and how it really is there and that they've got to get rid of it because well how about this the church is spiritual israel the jews are physical israel yeah it kind of messes everything up yeah the whole spiritual like I, i've been it's funny because they say it says in ephesians right that you know well, once we were far off we were strangers from the commonwealth of israel strangers from the promises right and once yeah foreigners from the commonwealth of israel before we had Christ, but now in Christ, right, we're fellow citizens. And so my question would be, like, as an American, am I a spiritual American or a physical American? Like, my citizenship. And I would just say, yes, I am, I am a citizen. That's a good point. And so when we, when we receive citizenship through Christ to the Commonwealth of Israel, it's a national identity. And I think that's where people get twisted up a little bit, is in not recognizing or understanding that the kingdom, the nation that God rules, is Israel, right? Um, and I think that that's, that's part of what people, you know, get frustrated with or whatever. So 
All right, you're going to read Acts chapter 3, verses 22 through it's, 26. It's great how we break this a up. prophet raised up. Yeah, a prophet raised up, Acts 3, 22 through 26. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after as many as have spoken have likewise foretold of these days. Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you and turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Wow. All right. So, so Moses obviously preached of a prophet that would come from amongst the brethren. Yeah. That would be own. likened wow, to him. Oh, that's in the Torah. We found Jesus in Deuteronomy. It is. And ding, 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 ding. they, amongst the Jewish people within Judaism, it is basically understood that that's the Messiah and that that prophet has yet to, to come, right? So where we find this, we find that Peter's quoting uh, De- Deuteronomy 18.15 to establish that Jesus was going to be that prophet or was that prophet, just like Moses. A comparison that points to a leader prophet that God had promised to send. Now, what's cool about this is that Peter is confirming our suspicions for us, right? We don't have to be like, oh, I wonder if Moses is talking about Jesus. He goes back to cross references. Remember when he had his first sermon, he was quoting Psalms? Right. Now he's quoting Deuteronomy. See, people don't even know their Bible. Right. Well, he, How are you going to know cross references? He quotes it and then says that it's Jesus, know, it's right? Amazing. So it's like black and white. That's inspirational. Um, and then in verse 23, Peter's quoting from... Uh, verse 19 of chapter 18, he says, And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. So if you ever wanted to know what does it mean in the Hebrew when he says, I will require it of him, it means that he shall be destroyed from among the people. Yeah, that's So we have pretty, another clarification. That's uh, Peter, you know, I find required, yeah. to be very clarifying. The like, Galilean. Even when we get to... You knew the word. Even when we get to the places where, like, he, the sheet comes down, and people are all confused over this, he interprets the vision yeah. for you Call and no gives it out unclean. to you yeah. in plain language and says, this is the interpretation of the vision yeah. that I received. I don't think Peter then went on and, like, had pork chops, right? That's, no. That's not what happened. No. So Peter it seems to be pretty good at clarifying things for us. Um, he also says, yea, and all the prophets from Samuel... And those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. Ye are the children of the prophets. Now, this is interesting because if you remember in the, our Matthew study, right, Yeshua is talking with the religious leadership, and they're boasting of the fact that if they were alive when the, their ancestors stoned the prophets, that they would not have done so all while threatening to kill Jesus That's a good point. Himself. That's a good uh, cross-reference in the New Testament. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Wow, because, yeah. yeah, they were saying, we wouldn't have done that. Yeah, listen, knowledge will, Jesus, like, many oh. will go to and fro. Yeah, knowledge will increase. Knowledge will increase, you know. Well, we wouldn't have done that. Oh, yeah, you would. Yeah. Well, and that's my point, is that the hypocrisy of the religious leadership is what he's pointing out. Wow. And I also think about how, you know, Jesus on the road to Emmaus, when he's talking to Cleopas and the other disciple, he told them, he, right, he opened the scriptures, and starting in Moses and all the prophets told them of the things concerning himself. Wow. And so what is he talking about? He's talking about the fact that he would come and suffer. I want that podcast. I mean, I would love the transcript. Can there's, I get the Road to Emmaus podcast? There's please? several things that I want the transcript Shh. of, but I put that at the top of my list. What about all the books that haven't been written? Remember, John said so there's not enough. I know. Right, right at the end there. Um, wow. So, That's interesting. Man, I just lost my train of the thought. The prophets, yeah. You were talking about the prophets. No, nah, I don't remember. So um, just that the prophets foretold all of these things would happen and then now they're happening and Peter is giving us that confirmation right here in the scriptures because what do we want to do we want to let scripture interpret scripture we want to allow Peter through the the Holy Spirit to tell us what do these things mean because we can come up with our own things right but 
again, and you know, Peter even talks about Paul and how confusing Paul is. So if you're confused by reading Paul, you're not alone. Even the people that were reading Paul that were contemporary to Paul were like, listen, many of these things that I'm discussing with you, Paul also wrote to you concerning. That's true. Many of which were hard to understand. (laughs) And people take it and twist it to their own demise, right? Well, we got to remember the Apostle Paul was taken out to the back of the desert for, what, three years or something? He was out there in the wilderness for three years? Yep. Many that, people say that he's at Qumran. That'd I mean, be a good movie. But then they also say, you know, I know, right? Who knows Woo. where he ended up. So uh, let's see. So the prophet Samuel had lived during the transition between the judges and the kings of Israel, and he was the first in a succession of prophets. Now, clearly, we have other prophets before him, right? We have Enoch. We have we Noah, right? We have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Um, so we have people that communicated directly with God, received revelation, and gave it to the people. But Samuel is the first one under the kingdom of Israel to receive the office of the prophet, right? He was sitting, he was seated as a, as an, in the office of the prophet. So Samuel will be the first in that case. And, and of so, course, the lineage of David, the Davidic line, the Davidic covenant is going to come from Samuel to anoint David. So he's probably show even a physical line of the scepter. Correct. Well, that's my whole point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that Samuel, being the first person to have the office of the prophet, right. one of the first actions he takes is anointing yeah. David. Coming out of the book of Judges. As the king and... Um, founding the the Davidic line, right? The royal line. And obviously that's the line from which the Messiah eventually comes. And all the prophets pointed to that future Messiah. And this is where I think, like I was thinking about this earlier, I think I might even told you this, that if Jesus would have come as the conquering king, we wouldn't know who he is today. He would have conquered and I mean, I'm sure we would, right? Obviously, he would come with the conquering king, and the kingdom would never end. I'm, I don't want to say it that way. Well, that's a good point. But because he came and suffered and died for our iniquities, right? Because let's just say these people are crying out to have the Lord come and vanquish their enemies. But what they don't realize is their biggest enemy is themselves. And so Jesus is coming to solve that problem because that problem has to be solved before they can right. they can reign in the kingdom with well, him. Well, two things have to happen. That's why if you if you look at the two days, the end of, at the end of the second day right now, if a day is the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years is his one day. So we needed those two days to continue with the punishment of scattering, then gathering, and also the gospel. Yeah, the gospel had to go out for two thousand years for two days. Amen. For two days, the gospel had to go out. So then uh, verse 26, the final verse here says, Unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Right? And so Peter noted that the covenant promised to Abraham applied to all the kindreds of the earth. The servant Messiah was for all only being sent to Israel first. The worldwide mission was already implicit in Peter's message. Only later, however, would he finally assimilate its meaning? So the word iniquities is um, paneria. Paneria, it means depravity, Mm. malice. Yeah. Or even special malice. Um, Plots, sins, wickedness, so depravity. So Which is interesting because I want to... Think about your bad habits, you know. Think about the iniquities that you keep doing. Yeah. That God God came to break us of this. Right. Of depravity. So, wow, that's good. So he's talking to Jewish religious leaders in this message here, right? right? And he says iniquities, and when he says iniquities, he doesn't use the Greek word anomia. That's good. Which is lawlessness. Is that another word for iniquities? So like when Jesus that's uh, is says, depart word? from me, I've never knew you, you workers of iniquity. The word oh, is anomia, which that's, is... That's another word for iniquities. Yeah, because nomos oh, wow. is law. That's good. Right? A nomos is without law. <coughs> <coughs> anomia, just changing it into lawlessness, right? The status of being without the law. So when he's talking to Jewish people, he's not using the word anomia, right? He's using the word paneria, which is a different word right. because he knows that they have the law. That's good. But they're still depraved, even though they have the law. 
That's good. So it's two different things. So my contention would be that when Jesus is saying, hey, but Lord, we didn't, we prophesy in your name, didn't we do this in your name? He's talking to religious leaders of the future wow. who would be lawless That's without good. Torah. That's which good. is even more rough. So, whew, what a whirlwind, huh? So what two points did you get out of Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 26? I think I could base it on two things here. Number one, God's miracles come with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I like mm, that. Mm. So you don't just do miracles or see miracles without the gospel of Jesus Christ or him getting the glory, number right. one. So God's miracles come with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, number two, God will continue to restore the kingdom of God until the Messiah returns. Boom. Yeah. There you go. So we sit at the marriage supper of the Lamb with him. That's good. My first one is health equals true wealth. And the way that I say this is that silver and gold, I have none. Yeah. But what I do have, I give to you. I like that. And truly what he's giving is much better than silver and gold. Because why? Because people would trade silver and gold to be healed. All right? People whose health is struggling. What is, what is the answer? Health equals true wealth. Um, so number two is repentance. What is it that we are still hanging on to in our minds that is opposed to the person of Jesus Christ, to the gospel as a whole, or to any biblical truth? Wow. We need to reconsider it because there are things. Like I'll give you an example, right? Homosexuality is one of those things where the Christian church at large is like, well, let people just be, you know, whatever. And I, and I agree, people have free will. I'm not saying go and, like, you know, burn their houses down. I'm not saying that by any stretch. But many people are now, like, joining pride parades and saying that Jesus' love is love and all of these, you know. What was that one sign? Jesus had two fathers? Oh my God. Like, because what they use is platitudes, like love is love, right? Okay, one of the things that people will say in the church is that God loves everyone. Right. For God so loved the world. But that's not true. God doesn't love everyone. He hates Esau. Because he hates Esau. <laughs> right? We won't get into that. Poor Esau. For, for Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated. It's kind of a dislike, yeah. But, Strong dislike. But, why, but think about this for a second. Why is it, like if God loves everybody the same, right, then does it really matter that he loves me? You know what I'm saying? But truly, God chose me, right, and has given me this revelation to know him and his, his son and to provide me with the saving knowledge of his son. That's a big deal. And so why is it that he hasn't given that to others? I have, I have like, my heart breaks for these other people, right? Oh, absolutely. So, so I what, respect their free will. What is going on here in this? So I just think that, that because God has the ability to hate and he hates sin, and he punishes sin. That means that the love that he has is so much more valuable because of that. Because I have come, because right, behold, what is it in Romans we read earlier? Behold the goodness and severity of God on those who fell, severity, but on right. you, goodness, as long right. as you continue in his goodness. So it's like, I don't know, that's a whole other topic, maybe for another day. But the point is, what is it that's a biblical principle that you have allowed the the culture or the world to influence you to where you're believing what the culture and the world says and not what the word of god says right those are the things that we have to take those things down one by one and reconsider them and repent change our mind reconsider sorry i was asking myself this question how do we know if we've been desensitized Ooh, yeah well, we have how do we know just if know we have been desensitized well um, we're not walking in the word of God. Mm. Mm -mm. So think about it. Okay. If so, something's being thrown at us from the culture, how are we responding to that? Yeah. I mean, like I said, you know, if, if you're not gunning for anybody, nobody's going to gun for you. I mean, that's what the whole social media is all about. Look what I have. Look at me. Look at my selfies. Look at my family. Look at me. Look at me. Look at this. And then, of course, it's also being used to go after others. Isn't it the yeah. opposite of the kingdom of God? Yeah. It's like we should be going after God and then living a life that is, that is righteous and good. And I feel like if we are know. going, if we're, if we're really chasing after God, we're seeking him, 
and then we are proclaiming that, um, you know, I don't think you're really doing a good job unless you got some haters, right? I mean, my thing is this: <laughs> I don't I, listen. I understand people want to have conversations and point things out. Oh, I, I get that. Yeah, that's I different. don't believe that God has called us out. No, the spirit of to debate, call everybody yeah, else the spirit out. Spirit of debate is, or just us. to put people down. Yeah. To be negative against our leaders, to, to be you know bad mouth them and this and that. I think we should pray for them. And, yes, of course. And and we could say, well, gosh, look, that was a blunder or this or that. But but yeah, I think we need to, we need to be careful with that, you know, because you reap what you sow. Yeah. Very yep. good. Amen. All right, you want to pray us out? You can do it. All right, Father, thank yeah. you so much thank for uh, your word. We thank you, Lord, that you are still healing even today. God, if there's anybody that is under the sound of my voice listening or watching this right now that needs healing, let them believe on the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Yeshua HaMashiach of Nazareth, Lord, that, that, that the Spirit of God will dwell in their body and heal them of whatever infirmity or affliction that they are facing right now, God. And we just pray this in Yeshua's mighty name. Amen. 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 All right. Well, listen, if you want to reach out to us, go ahead and uh, keep the conversation going in the comments. Like, subscribe, do all that good stuff. You can send me an email at ryan at twopraise.net if you want to get a hold of me. Bless you guys. Have a great week.